When the Second World War was over, we were the one great power in the world. The Soviets had a substantial military machine, but they, they could not touch us in power. We had this enormous force that had been built up. We had the greatest fleet in the world. We'd come through the war economically sound. And I think that in addition to feeling a sense of responsibility, we also began to feel the, the sense of a world power that possibly we could control the future of the world. Dressed up to win, we're dressed up to win, dressed up for victory. We are just beginning and we won't stop playing till the world is free. This time we will all make certain that this Our vision of progress is not limited to our own countries. We extend it to all the peoples of the world. Military action in Indochina. French regulars land along the coast in search of roving communist bands. For France, it represents a tremendous sacrifice of manpower and financial resources. Without American help, the burden would be too great. <laughs> expect that there is going to be a communist victory in Indochina. Nous étions au Quai d'Orsay et, et euh, Foster Dallas se rendait à Genève où j'allais le rejoindre euh, deux jours après. Et il me prit à part dans euh, l'embrasure d'une fenêtre euh, du salon du Quai d'Orsay et euh, il me dit Et si nous vous donnions deux bombes atomiques Je suis le seul témoin, nous étions deux. À la ferme, le sénateur, euh, le secrétaire Dallas a fermé deux atomic bombs. Deux. Euh, euh, neither one, neither three. Two. If Indochina goes, Several things happen right away. Uh, the Crop Peninsula, the last little bit of end hanging on down there would be scarcely defensible. The tin and the tungsten that we so greatly value from that area would cease coming. We don't see the end of the tunnel, but uh, I must say I don't think it's uh, darker than it was a year ago, in some ways lighter. Yes. So we must be ready to fight in Vietnam, but the ultimate victory will depend upon the hearts in the minds of the people who actually live out there. Throughout the war in Vietnam, the United States has exercised a degree of restraint unprecedented in the annals of war.
that enabled myself and my buddies to stay alive those many years. That one thing was faith. Faith in my family, my God, and my country. I remembered high school. I remembered playing sports there. And I can remember my coach saying, when a going gets tough, the tough get going, because winners never quit, and quitters never win. Why did I go to Vietnam? I will have to go back to 1965, when I was 22 years old. At that time, communism was once again trying to muscle in its way into a free country. I know of no communist analysis or non-communist analysis that would assert that there's a majority of the people in that country that want to be communist. Why do they need us, then? Because they were subjected to a military attack from outside. Uh, the, uh, are you really asking me this goddamn silly question? Oh, you really want me to go into this, Mr. Davis? I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, we really got to go back to, to fundamental. You want me to just go back to the origins of this thing, then? All right, I'll do it. But uh, this is pretty pedestrian stuff, I must say, at this late stage of the game. Honestly, it is. Well, I'll do it. I'm there's all right. A lot of disagreement about no, there's about not. The origins. No, there's not. There's no doubt. All right. Well, you. Now I'll I'll answer your question. You can throw away that tape. But uh, I didn't really expect to have to go back to this kind of sophomoric stuff. But I'll do it. The the problem uh, began uh, in its present phase after the Sputnik, the launching of Sputnik in 1957, October. This opened a phase of not well coordinated, but universally optimistic and hopeful communist enterprise in many parts of the world. Renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. We always hesitate in public to use the dirty word lies, but a lie is a lie. I mean, it's a misrepresentation of fact. And it's supposed to be a criminal act if it's done under oath. Mr. Johnson didn't say it under oath. He just said it. We, didn't, we don't usually have the president under oath. There are those who ask why this responsibility should be ours. The answer, I think, is simple. There's no one else who can do the job. If necessary, I am ready to go back. We all must be ready. You must have the political, economic, and philosophical courage to send me, or do whatever you think is necessary. I must be ready to go. If I did well, it is only because Lyndon did well in bringing me up and making me into a man. If I serve the military well, it is only because the military trained me to be a good officer. If I am a good American, it is only because America brought me up to be a good American. It was a sight to touch the heart of the most callous in the crowd. Lieutenant George Coker was back in Linden, New Jersey, the hero of the day. 3,000 people turned out to greet him. Schools were closed and streets were blocked as the young former prisoner of war walked on a red carpet to the steps of City Hall. Oh, I'm from Duncan, Oklahoma, which is about 90 miles south of here. And uh, I lived around several places, uh, Missouri and uh, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Germany. Uh, by the time I got out of high school, I was very conservative. We have, uh, in Duncan High School, we had bought, the high school had bought a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a John Birch package on communism. So we studied communism via the John Birch Society. And with the, the big red map with the flowing out of the disease and so forth, and, and learned how Karl Marx was a very cruel man and, and used to uh, make his family suffer and so forth. Uh, uh, so I, you know, when I got out of high school, I thought basically that, um, Teddy Roosevelt's what this country needed, and FDR had kind of sold us down the drain to the commies. The communist conspiracy is a deliberate and predictable plan of action to subvert the world. 
Mosinee, Wisconsin, in a unique May Day object lesson, shows what could happen here if communism took over. The unyielding chief of police is liquidated by American legionnaires portraying red trigger men. A grim demonstration of what subversion could lead to, Mosinee's May Day serves as a sharp warning to all democratic communities. It's an international criminal conspiracy. Before we know it, we're going to turn our backs around someday, and before we know it, the whole United States is going to turn around one day and see nothing but VC, or not VC, but communism. We're going to turn around and say, what happened? People are just walking in with riots, drugs, you name it. They're tearing us down from inside out. In 1917, when the communists overthrew the Russian government, there was one communist for every 2,277 persons in Russia. In the United States today, there is one communist for every 1,000 814 persons in this country. If we lose Indochina, Mr. Jenkins, we will lose the Pacific, and we'll be an island in a communist sea. Go ahead. How'd it go? Oh, Mother. I swear that I am not now or ever have been a member of the Communist Party. Feel better? Of course, when you get down to communism, uh, I've been fighting communism since 1951, actually. I always looked at, you know, the, the American fighting man as, as being, uh, you know, like, like a warrior of sorts, you know, due to, you know, my background, the way my mother brought me up. You know, she, she always spoke of the warrior societies of, of our tribe and of the different tribes around us and, and how that these men always had to, uh, to work to gain the respect of the people around them and, and how they... They had to live uh, more or less a life dictated to them by the society that they belonged to, and it was extremely hard. I, I looked around, and, and from listening to, to my uncles and a lot of my relations, they, they had been in the Marine Corps, and they always told me that the Marine Corps was the hardest service to cope with physically and mentally. And I naturally wanted to be the best at that time, and, and I, I looked at the Marine Corps as being the elite of the elite, the warrior society in the United States. Now, it might sound cliche-ish to say that my country may always be right, but right or wrong, my country. But that's how I felt back in 67. And during my senior year, I said, I've got an obligation to serve. I've got to fulfill it. There's no reason physically why I would be exempted. And therefore, I'm going to enlist. Picture, how much picture? Three thousand? I go with two hundred. Huh? I tell you straight up, just fifty money. You will be up to much money. I buy what? Fifteen hundred. Now you tell me. You lie, you lie, you die. You get massage? And what else you get? Huh? You buy me one beer. No, no, no money. Go home, mama son. Wait, go home, mama son. No, go home, mama son. No, go home, mama son. Okay? No, go home, mama son. No. No. Huh? How much? You? Uh, it's too much. It's too cool. Yeah, for sure. No, oh, no good. If you miss the train, I'm you will oh. know that I am gone. You can oh. hear oh, the whistle blow a hundred miles. Lord, I'm one. Lord, I'm two. Lord, I'm three. Lord, I'm four. Lord, I'm five. 
thought of ourselves, I think, as uh, trying to defeat communists, defeat accepting a view of uh, the Walt Rostow kind of view of covert aggression of some kind, the kind of view that enabled you to think of the conflict in really World War II terms. That was an unquestioned assumption. It had an idealistic flavor to it, but it was the underpinning of an imperial policy, basically. I shared the assumption very easily and, and felt it as an idealistic one, really, that we were doing something for them. I recall that I was in uh, the New York area at the time, and I stopped by to see General MacArthur, who I had known for several years. Uh, when he greeted me, he made uh, quite a prophetic statement. He said, Westmoreland, I, I see you have a new job. He says, I hope you appreciate that this new assignment is filled with opportunities, but fraught with hazards. And indeed, uh, this was a prophetic statement. much like uh, a, a singer doing an aria, you know, that's totally into what he's doing, you know, totally feeling it. He knows the aria, and he's experiencing the aria, and he knows his limits, and he knows whether he's doing it and doing, doing it well. Flying an aircraft can be a great deal like that. What's a race driver feel like? One is a guy want to drive in Indianapolis 500 and go charging around there. I guess perhaps the, the risk of, of dying, being killed, is part of it that makes it thrilling. I can tell when the aircraft feels just right. I can tell when it's about to stall. I can tell when it, I can't pull another fraction of a pound or the airplane will stall, flip out, and spin on me. And I would follow a little pathway on something like a TV screen in front of me that, that uh, would direct me right, left, or center. Follow the steering, keep the steering symbol uh, centered. Uh, I'd see a little attack light when we, when we uh, stepped into attack. I could pull the commit switch on my stick, and the computer took over. A uh, computer figured out the ballistics, the airspeed, uh, the slant range, and dropped the bombs when we got to the appropriate point uh, in whichever kind of attack we'd selected, whether it be flying straight and level or tossing our bombs out. So it was very much of a, a technical expertise thing. I was a good pilot. You know, I had, uh, uh, I had a lot of pride in my ability to fly. You're up there doing something that uh... Mankind has only dreamed of the, the flying, especially at night in an all-weather aircraft. The A-6 is one of the few that can really do it the way we did it. Um, a World War II aviator could not, would not even dream of doing the things we did. It's definitely the ultimate in aviation. Almost everybody has, uh, has uh, blown off firecrackers. The thrill you get when you see something explode as a child, or even as an adult almost. You put something in a can, and watch the can blow up or blow up in the air. And uh, the excitement, the sense of excitement, you know, especially if you're getting shot at, is just incredible. You get in there and have a real good mission, hit your target right on, find out later that you're, you're Target was totally destroyed. You know, it, was, it wasn't one of these misses or almost. You got it. Bang, it's down. And come back, make a night carrier landing recovery. Uh, that's fantastic. To, to say it's thrilling, yes, it's, it's uh, deeply satisfying. The planes again. Are they American or Vietnamese? I don't know whose they are. Just airplanes. And what was this here? I used to raise pigs here, right in there. Where was the kitchen?
The kitchen was here. We built it with bricks. This was the floor, and this was for the heat. What's that? That is the bomb crater. The bomb struck there and destroyed everything I had. An older sister died, and I have another older sister left. Yes, there were just the three of us, but then one died, and I'm supposed to live in a house over there. But now it's just a heap of rubble. How old was your sister? 78. What did she die of? Bombs. Bombs were dropped here the other day, and they killed her. I'm so unhappy. My sister died, and I've got no home left. I've moved in with my sister here. I've been wounded. Can't do anything for a living now. I'm old and weak. I've got nothing to sell, nothing to do. You really just don't have time for personal thoughts when you're up there flying around at five, six hundred miles an hour. You might call it an electronic war in a certain way. I didn't have time to think about anything else. If you wanted to later, you might. But it was all business. It's um, just strictly professionalism. We had a job to do. We went out and we did it. Never could see the people. You know, you, ne you never could see. Uh, occasionally, you saw the houses when you were bombing uh, around a village or bombing in a village. Uh, you, you know, you never heard the explosion. You never uh, saw any blood or any screams. It was very clean. You're doing a job. Yeah. You're an expert at what you do. <laughs> I was a technician. Everything just collapsed under the bombs. Everything just caved in. It's like a bird and its nest. The way things are with the house in a rubble. The bird comes home and finds no nest. Where am I to find a place to sit and work for something to eat? Even a bird needs a nest it can go back to, crawl into for sleep and food. Look, they're focusing on us now. First they bomb as much as they please, then they film. We fought against the Chinese for 12 centuries. We fought against the French for 100 years. And finally, when the war was lost by the French in 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, the Vietnamese were liberated from foreign oppression. But it was at that precise moment that the Americans came to Vietnam, little by little at first, then more and more as an invasion, an invasion of the American army. 500,000 of them in Vietnam. 
and this war became a war of genocide. The people of North Vietnam and South Vietnam fight only for freedom, independence, and national unity. This war is a war against the American imperialists. This is our war for independence. What we are trying to put across here this afternoon is to get you to realize that these weren't mythical, hazy people from the past. These were very real people. When they rose up against the most powerful army in the world, they were actually putting everything on the line that they had, their homes, their wealth, their past, and their future. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And when you judge the revolution and the problems and the success we had, it was a two-way street. A good many of the citizens at the time of the revolution <coughs> actually stayed and fought with the British. It was close to being a civil war in many areas. You actually split many, many families. Thomas Jefferson said the tree of revolution is, or the tree of liberty is what, watered by the blood of revolution every generation. I think that's a little exaggerated, but there's some truth to that. The war had come to Westchester County, but so too had independence and a new responsibility. Well, men are getting killed, men are killing. That's the parallel. As far as politics, are you kidding? Oriental politics? Don't put me on, man. Uh, his weapon yet, we're still looking for it, over. You got a weapon? No, sir. He had one, man. This guy's got ammo on I'd like to uh, medevac this guy. Uh, if we get him patched up, we might get some things away from him, over. What is this the people who are living in the jungle under the bombs without pay, without their families, are doing so because they're fighting for independence, because they're fighting, in this case, for unification, and they're fighting for revolution. Of course, the name for a conflict in which you're opposing a revolution is counter-revolution. And this was something we never admitted to ourselves at all. It's, it's what we were really doing. The letters and the reports we had on Ho Chi Minh's attitude back in 1946, he wrote, I think it was seven letters to this government and received no reply. The, 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 the pathos, almost, the, uh, the sadness that here's a man who felt and believed the United States would be sympathetic to his purpose of gaining his independence from a colonial power. And then to find we, you know, he, this is what he'd read. He'd been here. He'd read our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. He thought, surely the United States would be interested. We had testimony in the committee that his one worry was that it was so insignificant. Vietnam was so far away and so insignificant, we, we, we would never bother about it. It's too, too small or to ever attract the attention of the United States. He was sure in his own mind that if we would ever put our minds and focus upon it, we would be for him. How different history would have been for us and for them if we had felt a common interest in a colonial province like Vietnam seeking its independence of France. Uh, the uh, Ho Chi Minh of 56, I don't think could have got elected dog catcher in South Vietnam. Ho Chi Minh uh, dead. <laughs> Couldn't uh, beat any candidate we've ever put up in Vietnam. You asked me about my oldest son, Bing. He was a graduate of Harvard, 1965, and he was not a soldier at heart. Uh, he, but he realized, I'm sure there's no question, he realized that he was part of a big job that had to be done, and he was going to do it the way he did everything, full out. And he went out on this mission, uh, Mead River, and it was a big assault mission, bringing elements to this area just uh, south of Da Nang along the railroad line, and they encountered heavy, sustained uh, automatic weapons fire, and the helicopter ahead of him 
I believe, was uh, uh, dis was shot down, and then he went in, and his helicopter was uh, uh, he was actually killed in flight. That's what they and the airplane crashed, and uh, he and his co he was killed. His copilot was very badly injured, and I think there were 12 out of 15 or 16 of the people aboard were either killed or badly hurt. Many bombs, many coffins. These are for children. Eight or nine hundred a week. I have lost seven children myself. Many have died here. Though it's nothing like in the countryside, many more have died there. In the countryside, there are no coffins. There's no money to buy them. How did all the children die? Poison. Poison, you know. These planes keep spouting and spraying the stuff, and so many people have died. It seems to destroy their intestines. With this spraying and bombing, so many have died. Each day, right on time, the bomb craters appear. Hundreds of tons are dropped each day. <coughs> and we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it because we are afraid of the government. What you do? <laughs> Shaved. <laughs> I like to get it long. So what you been doing? After what they've done to you? Well, it's... It's a choice between that... or, uh, Canada, again. Or, uh, staying underground. Which is, uh, as you know, Have impossible. you been in contact with them? No. No, but I've got a lot of support. You'll get the same deal Mike's getting. Well, it's going to be a different type of thing. See, I'm going back publicly. We're having uh, ad hoc uh, congressional hearings. Yeah. It's really been building up over the past uh, couple of months now. And You're what it is... You're not going to be able to be there? Of course you're going to be there. We're going to try to get Ronnie there, too. Because you know what I feel about the army. All these people holding their heads high because they lost the sun. Vietnam or something. I don't think that's much to be proud of. They've lost more than they'll ever gain for the rest of their life. I wanted them. I wanted them. And I remember I was sitting like at the base of the hill and I was on one of the tanks and I had an M16 and I had stacks of magazines and there were two guys, you know, that were going through like some grass and bam, I dinged in on one of them, and I nailed him, you know? And uh, the Aussie with me confirmed, you know, that I dinged him. And I felt good, and I wanted more. And it wasn't that I wanted more for 
politics or anything like that, no, you know? I couldn't have cared if they were whatever. I just wanted them because they were the opposition, they were the enemy. Stinking little savages. Wipe them out, I say. Wipe them out. Wipe them off the face of the earth. Will we ever understand these Eastern races? Hit me, Poon, soon. <laughs> You hideous yellow monster. I wanted to go out and, and kill some gooks, you know. I, I, I really, I, I don't know, I, I guess I had been totally brainwashed because I could remember when, when people used to call me blanket ass or, or chief, and they still did, you know. I, I think the, my name was uh, Ira Hayes in boot camp, either Ira Hayes or Squaw, depending on what type of mood the drill instructor was in. But there I was, you know, saying, I want to go kill some gooks, you know. They were instructed. Um, to remove the eyes of the individual and place them in the hole in the middle of the back. And that would say to the Vietnamese, you have to understand, uh, that whoever did that was ubiquitous. In other words, the eye being the symbol of ubiquity uh, or of all present, uh, all powerfulness on the part of the Saigon government, which is an easy message for the local villagers to get. In fact, the American advisors didn't have that much of a stomach for the thing, so they used to use CBS... Uh, Logos, you know, the eye of CBS, and they would um, they would kill the individual, and then they would leave him with a kind of a calling card on him. At one point, I was invited to go along on an airborne uh, interrogation in a helicopter with the Marines northwest of Da Nang, and they took along two Vietnamese. You know, one was already reduced by beatings uh, with a rubber hose and some other methods of, of uh, beating and torture to the point where he couldn't talk, he couldn't respond. And as an example to the one they wanted to question. They would say, uh, if you don't tell us what we want to know, we're going to throw you out of the helicopter. And uh, he couldn't respond. He didn't understand. They were using uh, pidgin Vietnamese, which he didn't understand. That was more English than Vietnamese. They'd run him up to the helicopter. Two hefty EM were along, and they would take him by each elbow, and they'd run him up to the door of the helicopter. And they did this three or four times, and he was reduced to whimpering and crying. And they finally um, uh, told him that this was the last run. And he still responded the same way, and they just winged him out of the helicopter. The second fellow immediately started to babble anything he could tell them, any kind of, of information he could give them for one goal, and that was to reach the ground alive again. I just can't see in my mind, like you said, somebody throwing something out of a helicopter. I don't, I don't believe this kind of stuff happened. Maybe it did. I don't know. I never saw it, put it that way. Uh, I've seen GIs get mad and, uh, uh, Rather than shoot, a, shoot one of these dinks, uh, just punch him right out yeah. with his hand. Americans say the Vietnamese are just slant-eyed savages. The Vietnamese have 5,000 years of history. We fight against the invaders. It is not we who are the savages. with me, he was dead. And like, you know, here come the Jets, and everybody's, yay, Jets, you know, do it to him and all this shit, you know, get these motherfuckers off our ass, you know. Because they were digging in our behind real good. And like, the Jet came in, and he said, yay, Jet, get him. And you see him swooping on around, yay, Jet, get him. And he came over that way and let it go, and you say, uh-oh, you know. And you can see it, it's napalm canister, because you can tell them, because they spin ass overhead, you know, backwards as they're tumbling through the air, coming down. Big silver dollar. And the thing is just tumbling down, and you know it's coming right at you, you know? And like, wow, the napalm hit. I grabbed this dude and just put him up over my head in the hole like that. And fucking napalm went down the whole line, man. Just creamed. Everybody in the line. 35 dudes, man, just burnt. Post toasty to the bitter, you dig? And the napalm was just dripping in on both sides of this dude. He's dead, you know? I'm just holding him up, using him as a shield. So I just chunked this dude off of me and just sprung out of the hole. And I didn't know which way I was going outside the back. You dig and just ran through, burned my pants off, spent the rest of the battle running around with no drawers, my stuff just hanging out all over the place, you know, and all that. You ever try to fight a battle without any drawers on, man? 
I was at a very kind of sobering thing last night, a memorial service for four men in the second squadron who were killed the other day, one of them being a medic. And uh, the place was just packed. And we sang three hymns and had a nice prayer. I turned around and looked at their faces, and they were, I was just proud. My, my uh, feeling for America just soared because of their, the, the way they looked, they looked determined and, and, and reverent at the same time, but still they're a bloody good bunch of killers. When you go forth to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid. Well, let's not anybody be so naive as to think we're here in any way to worship football. Nor are we here, as I'm sure many people believe, to pray for a victory. We believe in victory. We believe it'll come to the team that's best prepared. This is serious business that we're involved in. And that's religious, and God cares. They're going to be men made tonight. And that's religious, and God cares about that. We're concerned about the big game, but we're also concerned about the bigger game, the biggest game of all that surrounds us, the game of life. May you be winners, winners in the big game, but even more importantly, winners in the biggest game of all, which we all play. Let us pray. <laughs> Because we got our kids geared to track like hell. You should check out the hickeys I gave this chick, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one on each side. It's a place where she can't hide them. Oh, really? Yeah. See, this one right here? Yeah, this one. And this one, this is the first one right there. It came out of kind of nasty, you know? Uh, no can do, I know. Maybe he did. He's not dead. Wake him up. What? Why he have to know how to do it? Huh? Why does he know how? Because uh -huh. you know wake him up. Hey, Charles, you can't do anything out of yours. Uh, what do you mean? This one's uh, uh, starting on. to go kind of sour on me, you know? Uh, she so keep it going, that. man. Huh? Keep it going. I'm trying to. But, well, uh, try. You know what it is about these chicks down here, you know, like they're, uh, well, what would you want to do except for, you know, Al Bolo? And, uh, right? Hey, you're number one. <laughs> this one got a set of knockers. Oh, this one is stupid. You want to take your goddamn bra? I'll take it off for her. Take it off for her? That's the name of the game. Here. You know what? Uh-huh. I'm in the pan. Ah, no, I'm number one. Hey. Hey, Charles. What? Charles. Hey. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> it's about time. <laughs> I got a mess in the night. Okay. It took you long enough, you know that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Check it out, baby. Check it out later, man. Check it out later.
You know, if my chick at home could see this now, man, she'd flip. enjoy it, some don't. Some just go out and do it as a job. It's a daily grind. What is it to you? I enjoy it. Now I know that he will have a very important message for each one of us. So I want you all to listen very attentively what he has to say to you, Lieutenant Copeland. Well, if you ever have to go to a war, and unfortunately, someday, you probably will have to fight a war, you'll find out that life becomes very simple because the only thing you're concerned about is living and dying. Everything else is unimportant because suddenly your life is at stake. And that's what it's like to be when you become a prisoner particularly if it's a prisoner of war. Because the thing that got us through were the things that we learned before we were 10 years old. I'd like to open up the questions now. Just raise your hand or yell it out, and you can ask any question you want about anything, and I'll do the best I can to answer them. How did you feel when the Vietnam War was over? How did I feel when the war was over? I felt real good, real good. It was a long war and a very difficult war to understand. But the reason we went there was to win this war. I volunteered to go. I would go again if I had to. And we wanted to win. That was our number one ambition. That was what we really wanted was to win this war. It took us a long time. So when it was finally over, when we knew that we had won, we felt great. We really felt great. What did Vietnam look like? What did Vietnam look like? Well, if it wasn't for the people, it was very pretty. Uh, the people over there are very backward and very primitive, and they just make a mess out of everything. How did you, how did, um, what do you feel about the people that um, went and burned their draft cards and went into Canada? We don't agree with them. I think these people were legally wrong. I think sometimes they were cowards. If they wanted to leave and go to Canada, that's okay. But they can't come back, though. It was they, they have disagreed. They say, we don't like your country. We don't like you, your people. They're saying that to you and me. You know, I don't like you, so I'm leaving. Well, fine, that's okay. There's no reason to hate a guy for that. Because that's also his right. But he can't come back. Instead of helping and aiding the Vietnamese people, I saw that we were party to their deliberate and systematic destruction. The Vietnamese were considered, all considered, less than humans inferiors. We called them gooks, slopes. Their lives weren't worth anything to us because we've been taught to believe that they were all fanatical and that they were all VC or VC sympathizers, even the children. 
Many of us, however, began to understand through our personal experiences in Vietnam the depth of the lies and deceptions practiced upon us and the American people by our country's leaders. It was they who trained us to kill without question and to hate our enemy, the Vietnamese. They concocted such phrases as kill ratios, search and destroy, free fire zones, secure areas, and so on to mask the reality of their combat policy in Vietnam. I make no apology for this act of resistance. I could do nothing else at the time. But underground life has become intolerable to me. So I'm here today to draw attention to the true facts concerning my case and the cases of tens of thousands just like me. We are not criminals to be hunted and, and imprisoned. Over a half million of us have deserted the military since 1965. Most of us have already returned to the military to be punished with jail and bad discharges that will be carried around for the rest of our lives. And it is a supreme irony to be prosecuted by the very same men who planned and executed a genocidal war in Indochina. Now, inside this hearing room, Eddie Souders has surrendered himself. Urged on, he says, by a hand-to-mouth underground existence, which still nags at many of his fellow deserters who continue to look over their shoulders. Paul Udall, NBC News, Washington. How was your sound? One more time. Let me respectfully tell the American people that this is their dirtiest and longest war. The Vietnamese fight only in self-defense. Ultimately, the Americans will see the light. If not, they will defeat themselves. You know, Vietnam uh, reminded me of a, of a child, the developing of a child. The laws of nature control the development of this child. The child has to sit up before it crawls. It has to crawl before it walks. It has to walk before it runs. No matter how many decades America fights, it will never conquer Vietnam, never. I'm telling you so that you will go back and repeat it to President Nixon. Over here, as long as there is rice to eat, we'll keep fighting. And if the rice runs out, then we'll plow the fields and fight again. I know very little about it over there, I'll tell you. And the le less I know, the better off I'll be. It, uh, it has not affected me a whole lot. I mean, the American, uh, the way of life is still here. And uh, if you work for it, it's there for you. But we're taught that we're to obey our governments. And I would have to go if I was instructed to. Once in a while I think about it, but I like to think about the things that are happening right now to me. I don't think it's affected mine at all. I don't even know who we're fighting for over there, to be real honest with you. I think we're fighting for the North Vietnamese, ain't we? I fled from Dao Tien to go live in Sui Dua. Then I was allowed to go back. I went back and stayed in Ben Chua. While I was in Ben Chua, trouble broke out again. So I was taken up to Koh Tak. I was picked up again and sent to Ben Chua to be lumped together with the others. My house burned down while I was away. Once more, I got sent to Koh Tak. I fled five, six, at least seven times already. The lives of my countrymen are worth no more than that of a fly. You take it and swat it dead. Just like that. Ladies, let me tell you, 
There once were some women amusing themselves, and one pushed the other onto a table. The ladies' falsies broke the table in two. If a table breaks, think of what would happen to a man's face. Watch it, they're filming. They'll make jokes. People in America will think we're ridiculous. We have about 15 companies now, including uh, insurance company and uh, tractor company. We are in the hotel business, in the travel agency business. We are the exclusive dealer for Ford in the country, Ford cars. Oh, many, many other things, uh, like uh, an oil company in the forming. We uh, have a bottling company. In other words, uh, we, greatly, we greatly believe in the future of this country, and uh, we think there's a great future for Vietnam, and uh, we think that uh, Vietnam will be livable, will not go communist, because otherwise all these companies will go to waste. And the way we work is we, ca we take a calculated risk. If we don't lose South Vietnam within the next three to five years, then nobody can catch up with us. I'm a Johnny-come-lately as far as war profiteering is concerned. Uh, the reason why I uh, organized this group of companies is because when I you know, was in Paris, I saw that peace was coming whether we liked it or not. Therefore, I got home in order to prepare for peace. All these companies have been organized uh, in order to prepare for, for peace and prepare for the economic takeoff that will come with peace. Like we have the infrastructure of hotels, of travel agencies and things like that, but of course there are no tourists in Vietnam now, but there will be. And uh, we are getting ready for that sort of thing. Seven guys really got hurt. We ran into a battalion ambush, she said it was. And uh, it was supposed to be one of the ambushes of Ted Season, one of the biggest. And uh, we called in two, two or three medevacs, and they got hit. So finally, the last one came in, got us out. And from that, I never saw any of the other guys that I was with, except for one or two, and that was about it. Most of the guys that we keep in touch with are the guys in the hospital. They usually have a reunion once a year. It's about it, there's really not that much to talk about. And here we are, the one thing that we said, and I don't give a shit now. I don't care about the football game now. I don't care about anything now. The one thing that we want to show these bastards was masculine pride, didn't we? Is that we come down and show them a great masculine effort? And what the fish are you doing? What are you doing? Just go, man! Don't let them beat us! 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 Don't let them beat us!
Make no mistake about it. I don't want a man in here to go back home thinking otherwise. We are going to win. Since the Lunar New Year, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese have proved they are capable of bold and impressive military moves that Americans here never dreamed could be achieved. Whether the Viet Cong can sustain this onslaught for long remains to be seen. But whatever turn this war now takes, the capture of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon for seven hours will be a story to rally and inspire the Viet Cong. Don North, ABC News, at the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. I knew that, as was the case in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II, that after the enemy exposed himself, we would defeat him, he would be weakened, and if we could follow that up through the use of, uh, of the, the maximum military force that we could bring to bear on him through the bombing, through the mining of the harbors, through the cutting of his lines of communication, by moving in and cleaning out his sanctuaries, the enemy would have no choice but to come to some accommodation. In the beginning of 1968, General Westmoreland needed 206,000 more troops. We met hour after hour after hour in the Pentagon, and I started in and asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff, how long do you think that we'll still be in the war? None of them knew. Uh, do you think that the 206,000 men will be enough? Nobody knew. Well, um, might we have to send more men? Well, possibly. Well, in six months, we don't know. A year, 18 months? I couldn't get answers to these questions. By the end of that four-day interrogation, I was getting down by the end of it into very serious questions like, do any of you men, as you look at it objectively, do you find any diminution in the will of the enemy to fight? Well, they said, no, we guess we don't. Are they sending the same number of men down through the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Well, yes, and even they might be a little more. And uh, how about our bombing? We've, we've placed great reliance on our bombing. Is our bombing stopping them? No. Well, what is the amount of attrition that our bombing's causing? Well, maybe 10 to 15 percent. So I remember asking one question. Well. If a North Vietnamese field commander in South Vietnam needed a thousand men, they said yes. If he asked for, say, 1,200 men, a thousand would get through. Well, that's right. Well, then he'd have the thousand that he really needed. Well, yes, that's so. Well, this type of interrogation, finally, by the end of four or five days, I must say, that my thinking had undergone a very substantial revolution. after the Tet Offensive was over. And it's like two boxers in the ring. One boxer has the other one on the ropes, but uh, the man who is uh, about to be the victor has his second throw the towel in. Accordingly, I shall not see, and I will not accept, 
the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I don't think it would help them one bit. All I think we've done is destroyed their country, laid it waste. No, I don't think we've helped them. As, of, as fellow human beings, I don't think they should be there doing that. Certainly a mature person can say they made a mistake. Why can't a government? You know, you let us all go off to war and say, yay, team, you know, fighting Vietnam and all this kind of shit in 1965 through 1968. Now 1968 comes along and boo, team, come on home and all this shit, you know, and don't say nothing about it because we don't want to hear about it because, you know, it's upsetting around dinner time, you know. Well, goddamn, it upset me, you know, for a whole goddamn year. It upset a lot of people to the past point where they're fucking dead, you know, and all this shit. Now, you don't want to hear about it. I tell you about it every day. Make you sit down and puke on your dinner, you dig? Because you got me over there, and now you done brought me back here, and you want to forget it so that somebody else can go do it somewhere else? Hell no, uh-uh. And you're going to hear it all every day as long as you live because, hey, it's going to be with me as long as I live. When I get up in the morning, when John gets up in the morning, when a lot of dudes just sitting around here get up, man, their gut hurts because they got shot there. I got to put on an arm and leg because it ain't there no more, you dig? And all the rest, my man here's got a hole in his stuff. He can't work right, you know? Now, you do something about that. You know, make that all disappear, you dig? You know, make it all go away with the 6 o'clock news. Turn it off, you know, or switch it to another channel and all that shit. Uh-uh, the hell with that, you dig? It's here and it's for real. And it's gonna happen again unless these folks just get up off their ass and realize it has happened, you know? <laughs> The country is ready to pass a reasoned judgment on this war. The people have judged, I think, that it's unwise and immoral and not in the national interest of this country, and that therefore it must be brought to an end. For 20 years, first the French and then the United States have been predicting victory in Vietnam. In 1961 and in 1962, as well as 1966 and 1967, we have been told that the tide is turning. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. We can soon bring our troops home. Victory is near. The enemy is tiring. Once in 1962, I participated in such a prediction myself. But for 20 years, we have been wrong. The history of conflict among nations does not record another such lengthy and consistent chronicle of error as we have shown in Vietnam. I had just given the policy line, stayed up all night with Adam Walensky and Peter, Let Peter Edelman, helping on a speech for Robert Kennedy, which proved to be his last speech given in San Francisco here at Businessmen's Luncheon on Vietnam. Uh, I went up with some corrections last thing in the morning and shook hands with him uh, in his bathrobe as he stood there, and then he came down uh, from the Ambassador Hotel and got into a car. We were struck with the, how easy it was to get onto that floor and to approach him at that point. At the conference on lessons of Vietnam, of course, in the morning, I learned that Robert Kennedy had died. for a lot of people to feel powerless. <sighs> so, um, it began to look as there was no way to change this country. this road for so many years, and I had felt so strongly before that this was the right policy. 
that it was difficult for me to change. I know now that the domino theory was a false theory. I know now that we should not have become involved. As far as I'm concerned today, I have no hesitancy whatsoever in saying I could not have been more wrong in my attitude toward Vietnam. Vietnamese cross the gallantry with Silver Star. Gallantry ground combat. Four air medals. And I was there with it. And I got a colonel that's flying upstairs and he's getting down on me and he's saying, take the hill, take the hill, take the hill. So I got together with the tank commander and I said, look, let's take three tanks and we'll walk the Auburn up the hill. You know, and we'll lay down a base of fire as we're going. I said, okay. Got with the oven. I said, let's fly. So I popped up behind the lead tank and uh, started to go up the hill. And everything was cool until we started taking fire. And uh, the oven started to split. And that's when I got it. I said, oh my God, I'm hit. I couldn't believe it. You know, I, I can't believe it. I'm really hit. And my first, first thought was Kay, my girl, you know. <laughs> it's going to sound stupid, but, I'm, but my thought was she'll kill me, you know. Here I was dying, <laughs> and I was worried that she was going to kill me, you know. But then I realized that I didn't have to worry because I was dying. It's all over. And for what, you know. My last, my last conscious thought was, I can't believe it, I'm dying. On this shitty piece of ground, I'm dying. And I can't fucking believe it. Bobby was a surfer, he was a wrestler, he was a, a long distance runner, we danced, we, he was active, active, active. Our whole life was active. And now they're telling me that he's paralyzed. He couldn't believe it and I couldn't believe it. Right now, Bobby's not a boyfriend, he's not a husband, he's not a brother. It, it's, it's very, It's very hard. What hurts the most, and this is a purely personal thing, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, that's how I feel. When I was in the Marine Corps, I remember I was down in Marine Corps barracks in Washington. They call it 8th and I. And they had the Marine Corps drill team there. And I was standing in attention in my uniform, and they were playing the Marine Corps hymn, and then they played the Star Spangled Banner. And I actually started to cry. I cried because I was so proud to be an American, you know? And I was so proud to be a Marine and in uniform standing there at attention. That, that represented so much to me in the way of life and that's gone, you know? And that hurt, that hurts. That's what I'm bitter about. Truman lied from 1950 on 
on the nature and purposes of the French involvement, the colonial reconquest of Vietnam that we were financing and encouraging. Eisenhower lied about the reasons for and the nature of our involvement with Diem and the fact that he was in power essentially because of American support and American money and for no other reason. Kennedy lied about the type of involvement we were doing there, our own combat involvement, and about the recommendations that were being made to him for greater involvement. President Kennedy lied about the degree of our participation in the overthrow of Ziem. The um, Johnson, of course, lied and lied and lied about our provocations against the North Vietnamese prior to and after the Tonkin Gulf incidents, about the plans for bombing North Vietnam and the nature <coughs> of the uh, buildup of American troops in Vietnam. Nixon, as we now know, misled the, and lied to the American public for the first months of his office in terms of our bombing of Cambodia and of Laos, ground operations in Laos. The reasons for our invasion of Cambodia and of Laos and the prospects for the mining of Haiphong that finally came about in 1972, but was envisioned as early as 1969. The American public was lied to month by month by each of these five administrations. As I say, it's a tribute to the American public that their leaders perceived that they had to be lied to. It's no tribute to us that it was so easy to fool the public. We have adopted a plan which we have worked out in cooperation with the South Vietnamese for the complete withdrawal of all U.S. combat ground forces and their replacement by South Vietnamese forces on an orderly scheduled timetable. This withdrawal will be made from strength and not from weakness. As South Vietnamese forces become stronger, the rate of American withdrawal can become greater. Congratulations to Battalion 332 on your recent victories over the communists. We ask ourselves, when will peace come? And I tell you, if you chase the communists back to the north, there won't be any war in this hamlet. Help rebuild the houses. Help the people. Rid the hamlet of all VC so there will be no more suffering and destruction for ourselves and our compatriots. <laughs> Oh, my friend. Oh. <laughs> I can see you again. Just come back, sir. Fine. Just go back, yeah. How you doing, Ben? Good afternoon, sir. Very good to see you. How you doing? Good to see you. Hey, oh. How you doing? Fine. <laughs> Just so got back this afternoon, sir. Oh, yeah. Been very quiet. Glad to have you. No Except problems. last time in the... Uh, when the uh, rockets went off to... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah, I read about it in Stars and Stripes. Mm -hmm. That's one of our success We've, stories here, this battalion is. We had a uh, real... Uh, we just trouble gave with, uh, <coughs> four bronze stars mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. five archons with V device this mm -hmm. week mm -hmm. to the battalion commander and three of his officers yeah. and five soldiers. And we have uh, six impact boards appending for uh, last Saturday night's action where we killed six VC and captured nine weapons. Uh, he had been the uh, recon company commander of the uh, 263rd, and uh, he'd done a real tremendous job as... Uh, <laughs> just as the recon company commander, and then they uh, moved him over here, and in a 10-day uh, period, or maybe a two-week period, he uh, completely reversed it. They had the battalion here uh, under a very poor major commanding officer, and uh, they had it to the point where the company commanders were throwing down their weapons and crying, or at least one of them did, and uh, then 10 days later, they had a big contact with the uh, VC, and uh, in three days, killed uh, 42, lost none of their own, uh, he does it with a fairly limited uh, staff. Although some of his people, like that uh, young major over there, like Yuck, tremendous guy. Just heard his name over there. Ba người, ba người, ba người. Đây đây súng này liên với em mười sáu. Một người nữa. It's no surprise that in a very poor country, you can find people who will wear foreign uniforms, 
What has always surprised us, what we've never been willing to predict or understand, is that the Vietnamese communist leadership can find enough people to live in the tunnels, fight for nothing, wearing ragged shorts year after year under the American bombs. A war in which one side is entirely financed and equipped and supported by foreigners is not a civil war. The only foreigners in that country were the foreigners we financed in the first part of the war and the foreigners we were in the second half of the war. Basically, we didn't want to acknowledge the scale of our involvement there. We didn't want to realize that it was our war because that would have been to say that every casualty on both sides was a casualty caused by our policy. The question used to be, might it be possible that we were on the wrong side in the Vietnamese war? But we weren't on the wrong side. We are the wrong side. You have exemplified in your corner of the world patriotism of the highest order. You have brought to your great task of organizing your country the greatest of courage, the greatest of statesmanship. J'avais deux possibilités. Ou I had two possibilities. Either I could submit to Washington's politics. Every morning, yes, sir. Ou alors, or I would have to resign. Bien sûr, uh, comme soldat, je me you can be sure that as a soldier, I only submit very rarely. And in fact, never. I chose the second solution, that of resigning. On the Vietnamese side, I would say the most encouraging factor is the promise offered by General Khan's government. Through the means of a security service in the president's office, we taped all communications with the outside, all telephone communications. And fortunately, among these taped telephone communications, I still have the tape from which we can hear precisely General Taylor stating precisely that he wants me General Khan, General Khan to leave Vietnam. Can you let us hear it? Certainly, I hope it works. Certainly, I hope it works. This is General Khan speaking. How are you? Glad to hear from you. May I speak in French? You can speak a lot more, if you please. Euh, L'entrevue que nous avons hier, oui. euh, euh, vos désirs étaient euh, à ce que je quitte le commandement de pays. Vous tenez toujours à, à vos désirs hier, à ce que je quitte le pays, n'est-ce pas Ah oui, ah, oui c'est vrai. Entendu. Ah. Alors, euh, je vous rappellerai cet après-midi. Merci bien. Au revoir. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, as our joint communiqué indicates, President Tu and I have had very constructive talks with regard to how we shall work together in the years ahead, working for the program of peace, which we now hope will all be the wave of the future, not only for the Republic of Vietnam, but for all of the countries in Indochina. What kind of freedom could you preserve here when you put so many of our compatriots into prison without any charge, without any reason? Why? Just because that you, you want to, us to have freedom? What kind of freedom could you give us? We know that we only have freedom if we fight for it. But here, we fight for what? Les gens peuvent être arrêtés à n'importe quel moment 
People can be arrested at any moment by any organization and then tortured in inhuman ways in all the prisons and above all in police stations. And then in prison for years and years without trial. Their only crime is loving their country. They had the courage to tell the truth. They asked for the liberation of political prisons. They asked for an end to the war. They asked for peace, for national reconciliation. And all that is considered a crime by the government of Tiu. I was arrested in 1968. I was at home when the security police came. They took me to headquarters for a few questions and kept me. You can't imagine how badly I was beaten. Mostly on the head. My eyes are bad now. After I was arrested, I was beaten so badly. Even now, I sometimes have headaches and nosebleeds and ear bleeds. In those days, all we were getting to eat was rotten fish. So we asked for some vegetables. But when we complained, we were beaten and chained, and lime powder was thrown on us. And they poured water on us, and we had nowhere to run. Our cells were this big, and we could do nothing but stand where we were and get the water and the lime all over us. Some of us lost our teeth and our hair, and when the lime got wet, it just boiled up, bubbling all over us. Our hair fell out, and our skin became covered with sores. They said that if we were innocent, they would beat us until we were guilty. And that if we were guilty, they would beat us until we repent. In a country where the people don't hold national sovereignty, in a country where the government has turned himself to be the enemy of the people, the prisoners are the patriots. And no matter how badly treated we are still, we are proud to, because at least we are free instead of enslaved as so many of the so-called government officials. And so you see, when a Vietnamese works for peace and for liberty, he is considered a communist. It is an honor for the communists to have to work for peace and justice. So it is the government which gives validity to being a communist, because they continue to say that the people who work for justice and for peace are communists. You see? We were learning to be good soldiers back when you're three, four, five, six years old. That's where a good old mom is telling you to obey the local camp regulations. In this case, it's the house. And you start to learn to respect authority. And so finally, lo and behold, at 20, 22 years old, you find yourself in service, and you maybe take that last and final step where you become quite regimented in a military form of discipline. Like I say, that stuff isn't worth the, the paper it's written on if the uh, basis isn't there. You need that cornerstone that goes back when you're a kid. And who's teaching it to you? The good old moms, women like yourselves. It's, it's terrifying, it's true, when you're facing a torture session with a bunch of gooks, it's gonna be pretty darn miserable, and there's no doubt about it. You're scared, you're really petrified. But at the other side, you have a bunch of women back there that know that uh, they're telling you, you better do something, you know, and that's, that's the wrath of God, boy, you don't want is 100 women climbing down your back. So you figure maybe the gooks aren't so bad. So you press on. In many respects, the destiny of our country, and more personally, the destiny of me, your men, your children, is in your hands. If you are proud of the POWs and personally of me, then you should be proud of yourselves.
because I was what you made me to be. As for my own view, uh, I thought through as best I could the meaning of Southeast Asia, the United States, in the 1950s, looking backward and looking forward in terms of what I know about the dynamics of societies and so on. And on balance, I came, it, was, it is an on balance judgment. I came to the judgment that it's a vital interest to the United States. I've never had any reason to change that judgment. And uh, therefore, I, uh, I do believe that uh, what, we've, what we have done is, is generally right, although I would have preferred to have seen a, uh, a different, more decisive military strategy. Certainly, to me, the day that you can say that a sacrifice such as that is not worthwhile is the day that you've destroyed all your real values of what is worthwhile and what isn't. And there's no question in my mind that he and everybody else that did what he did, there is no sacrifice that was in vain, absolutely none. That down the line, that's the price that you pay for freedom, and that's the price that you pay for the kind of uh, stature that we have, and it's the kind of risk you take to preserve the ideals that we have. He had just a tremendous sense of humor and just an amazing instinctive sense of what was important and what wasn't. Yeah. I remember when I was getting ready for our oldest daughter's wedding and I was upset because something or other wasn't going well and he called up from Pensacola and he said, how are things going? And I said, fine, Bing, but such and such has happened. He said, oh, mom, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> and, you know, it just made all the difference. I thought, yeah. that really is small stuff, you know? And it was, yeah. and it made the whole thing much easier. And of course, I came up in a tradition where military service was, uh, in World War II, there was no question everybody was part of it. There was not the kind of dissension and so forth that, that has been surrounding the Vietnam uh, thing. But I think that most of the people of this country are too busy to get involved deeply in uh, uh, on uh, the kind of things that the dissenters do. In other words, I think the, really the strength of our system and I think it's a terrific system, is that you do rely on somebody like President Nixon for leadership. And I think his team of people with him are outstanding. And to me, the leadership that he has shown and decisions that he has made uh, really have uh, uh, that they're the kind of decisions I would expect from the president of this country. And the action he has taken as the action I'd expect from the president of this country. I think the whole ju executive, legislative, and judicial system that we have is superb. It has worked many, many, far better than any other system I'm aware of and brought us to a state of, of power and, and uh, really of international uh, stature that we have a responsibility to stay with and to, to uh, uphold. <clears throat> what did your son want to become? I suspect he would have been gone into the newspaper. He actually had just got a job with the New York Times when he went into the uh, OCS. And he'd worked for newspapers in the summer while he was at college. I suppose that it's like any pain, you don't remember pain too well afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Dear people, I'm thrilled to be here with you guys. This is what I like, a captive audience. <laughs> it is always the custom at a dinner at the White House to have a toast to the honored guest. The difficulty tonight is that there are so many honored guests that we would be drinking all night and into the day. <laughs> said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> the most difficult decision that I have made since being president was on December the 18th of last year. 
And And there were many occasions in that 10-day period after the decision was made when I wondered whether the country really supported it. But I can tell you this, after having met each one of our honored guests this evening, after having talked to them, I think that all of us would like to join in a round of applause for the brave men that took those B-52s in and did the job. My eight-year-old daughter was killed, and my three-year-old son. Nixon, murderer of civilians. What have I done to Nixon so that he comes here to bomb my country? My daughter died right here. She was feeding the pigs. She was so sweet. She is dead. The pigs are alive. My mother and my children took shelter here. Here they died. The planes came from over there. No targets here. Only rice fields and houses. I'll give you my daughter's beautiful shirt. Take it back to the United States. Tell them what happened here. My daughter is dead. She will never wear the shirt again. Throw this shirt in Nixon's face. Tell him she was only a little schoolgirl.
doesn't put the same high price on life as does the Westerner. Life is plentiful, life is cheap in the Orient. And uh, as the uh, philosophy uh, of, uh, of the Orient uh, uh, expresses it, uh, uh, life is uh, is not important. During the missions, after the missions, the result of what I was doing, the result of this, this game, this uh, exercise of my technical expertise, never really dawned on me, that reality of the, of the screams or, or the, uh, the people being blown away or their homeland being destroyed uh, just was not a part of what I thought about. As Americans have never experienced that. We've never experienced any kind of devastation. When I was there, I never saw a child that got burned by napalm. I didn't drop napalm, but I dropped other things just as bad. I dropped CBUs, which can't destroy anything. It's meant for people. It's an anti-personnel weapon. We used to drop canister upon canister of these things with 200 tumbling little st little balls in there about this big around with something like 600 pellets in each ball that would blow out as soon as they hit the ground uh, and shred people to pieces. They couldn't be gotten out in many cases. The people would suffer. They would, they would live, but they would suffer, you know, then often they would die afterwards. And this would cause people to have to take care of them, you know. But I look at my children now and... Uh, I don't know what would happen if, uh, uh, what I would think about if someone napalm. Do you think we've learned anything from all this? I think we're trying not to. I think I'm trying not to sometimes. I can't even cry easily. From my, uh, my manhood uh, image. <clears throat> I think Americans have tried, we've all tried very hard to escape what we've learned in Vietnam, to not come to the, net, the logical conclusions of what, what's happened there. You know, the military does the same thing. You know? They don't realize that uh, people fighting for their own freedom 
are not going to be uh, stopped by just changing your tactics, you know, adding a little more sophisticated technology over here, improving the tactics we used last time, not making quite the same mistakes. Uh, you know, I think history operates a little different than that, and I think uh, that, that those kind of forces uh, are not going to be stopped. I think Americans have worked extremely hard not to see uh, the criminality uh, that their officials and their policymakers uh, have exhibited.